Hello and welcome to Castle Talk, where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, writer of the upcoming Young Captain Nemo Quest for the Nautilus from Macmillan Books, and currently available Castle of Horror Anthology Volume 2, Horror for the Holidays. This week, we're chatting with David Moody, whose new book, Chokehold, comes from St. Martin's Griffin Books. A pioneer of independent publishing, David Moody first released Hater in 2006, and without an agent, succeeded in selling the film rights to the novel to Mark Johnson of Breaking Bad and Guillermo del Toro, who all we, all, we all know from The Shape of Water. He says he has an unhealthy fascination with the end of the world. I'm certain that's true. Likes to write books about ordinary folks going through absolute hell. You can find out more at David Moody dot net welcome david thank you glad to be here i i this is a this is a a hard book man this is and i don't mean hard to read i mean it's a it's a uh it's it's a hard-edged pulse pounding book chokehold is uh so i i uh i i want to talk to you about it and about your process so okay. first of all chokehold's the new book it's in a world that you've established with several books already. So tell me about what's going on and who are these main bodies of characters, the haters versus the unchained. Okay. Well, um, I should always say, whenever I sign a book for anybody, I always go and go to say, um, hope you enjoy it. But I don't think anybody really enjoys my books. I think they kind of endure my books and, and manage <laughs> to get through them. But that's an intentional thing, so that's not a problem. Um, this book, Chokehold, is a, it's an important one for me because it's the very last book in in the Hater series. Mm. And you mentioned Hater there because Hater is what really it it, it moved me from being a, a, a quite a small independent publisher who, who not many people had heard of to suddenly getting you know, decent deals with St Martin's Press and the like. Because somehow, and I, I don't know how, and I hate to think how because the chances must have been astronomically stacked against it. But a copy of the original Hater book ended up on Guillermo del Toro's desk. Mm. And he went on to option it. And then um, I, I wrote three books about a decade ago. So Hater, Dog Blood, Them or Us. And to, to kind of set the scene, Hater is about, I, I, I was thinking about the way that we split ourselves up as the human race. We'll find any excuse that we can to draw mm. a line between ourselves and everybody else. So it might be your, I know, your, your religious beliefs, your hair color, your height, your intelligence, your wealth. And we just look for all these divisions that we can, and we use them to differentiate ourselves and, and often to prejudice against other people. And, and, and I thought, well, what would happen if a new divide came along, a, a, a divide that just makes one half of the human race completely unable to live with the other half of the human race, which is pretty mm. much what we've got anyway. Yes. But, um, but, but it's just a, a black and white divide that you're either a hater or unchanged. You're either a killer or you're a victim. And both of these sides know that the only way that they can survive is by completely obliterating the other side. So it's interesting. I, I think it's interesting because it, in getting rid of the old divides, you're, you're carving up new lines between families, between lovers, between teachers and students, between employers and employees. It kind of resets the dial a little bit. So I, I, I wrote this original trilogy quite a way back. And the the thing with Del Toro, the the film adaptation, it almost got to scream, but then kind of fell apart as these things do. Mm. Uh, and I eventually ended up selling the rights to um, a, a guy I'm working with still in in here in the UK. Oh. And at one point, we were talking with a, a TV uh, network about a hater TV series, and it just occurred to me that I'd only told one side of the story because. Haters told from exclusively from the point of view of of one of the the haters, somebody who's changed. Yeah. And by the way, when I, when I when I picked the word hater back in two thousand and whatever, it didn't have the kind of gang the, warfare the connotations that it, that it has today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And here in the UK, it, it wasn't even a word. It just it just sounded cool at the time, and and man, how wrong I was. But never mind. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck with that now. So we were talking about a, a possible TV adaptation. And things were looking really good, and we almost signed on the dotted line. But again, as as happens, these things fall apart at the last minute. Mm. But in in thinking about the TV series, I thought it, it it's all well and good, but really, you you can't tell a TV series from one person's perspective in the same way that you can write a series of books. Sure. And so I wrote a second trilogy, which tells the the flip side. It tells the unside. I'm uh, sorry, unchanged side of things. So looking at the the same events. And some events I hadn't spoken about before, but just looking at them from the from the, the the point of view of the opposition, really, so I could expand the world a little bit and get my head into into uh, like both halves of the story, which has been a bit of an experience because I've realised that it doesn't matter what side you fall on, human beings can be pretty vile people. Yeah. 
you said that you love writing about the end of the world you know about yeah. w w which i presume to mean the end of the way the world the way we think the world works because there's still a world in these characters they're 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 moving through the countryside it's just been greatly damaged yeah. what what is it what is it about destroying the world that that makes you interested i think the way you, you described it then is absolutely excellent that, that that that's exactly what i'm after the way the world stops working as it is at the moment mm. because uh, i when i say this i always feel like a bit of a, a voyeur a bit of a pervert but i'm a mm. people watcher i avidly watch people watch everybody around me and i'm fascinated by our, our interactions and reactions to each other and um I'm also interested with the way that that we we wrap ourselves up with so many levels of expectations in society. This mm. is how you'll behave. This is how you'll think. This is how you'll talk. This is what you'll buy. This is what you'll consume, and so on. And it just occurs to me that the only time where I think that we'd ever see people truly acting as they want to believe, as their instinct tells them to believe, would be in an apocalyptic situation where mm. all the other rules are stripped away, all the niceties, if you can call them niceties of society, disappear, and people just start behaving in the way that they would have to behave to survive. So I yeah. think it gives you a, a much a much clearer view uh, of human nature, or what I presume human nature to be. You have this uh, this leader of the of the haters who's who's taken over a, a large cathedral uh, in uh, in Oxford, I think. I, 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 well, I don't recall. <clears throat> Cambridge, yes, and and um, and you talk about how the you know what strikes me is the moment that you're talking about where society falls apart and then people start acting the way they want to act would last a very short period and then you would get then you would get leaders and you would start to build society almost instantly because it just seems like that's that's what happens in the book is is there yeah. you know all of these people are gathered around her they don't even want to sleep far away from her because they know that she's the center of power and and you know uh, uh her decisions affect everybody and, and i was just i was just thinking about the fact that yes it's ugly and yes, the old society breaks down, but it's like we cannot help but start building new new society almost instantly. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right, and 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 I, I do believe that's what would happen. Um, we we instinctively we we crowd together, don't we? We look for yeah. for ways to protect ourselves, and often uh, they say there's safety in numbers, and it and it's true. So yeah. the reason that that, that Johansson, the character in the book, gets such a big following is because. She's the biggest and baddest of this group of very big and bad people. Yeah. But then, kind of as the, as the story progresses, we can, we see how how people's loyalties will shift because if there's a a bigger bad than the one you're aligned with, well, where where are you going to go? Who are you going to stand alongside? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I I think you're absolutely right. You know, I'm curious about you, you um your process of being an independent writer and then moving to working with a, a you know a traditional publisher yeah. so you're working with saint martin's and it doesn't get much more traditional than saint no. Martin's. you know this is the publisher of silence of the lands right they're mm -hmm. they're and what are your if if you're at a conference and somebody says gosh david i'm trying to decide should i should i self-publish my book or should i go you know start pitching to an agent and try to get to saint martin's or whatever but, you know uh, what would be your recommendation to them? My, my recommendation is, I don't know if this is what St. Martin's would want me to say or not, but my recommendation would be just to, to get your book written first mm. and then just just get it out there. And, and that, that's what happened with me. I, I I had a book published many, many, many years ago. This is when I feel old. It was about 22, 23 years ago. It was published traditionally and it, it just sank without trace. It disappeared. Mm. And then... I, I kept writing. I wrote a, a zombie series called Autumn, which did, which did quite well for me. But mm -hmm. I, I initially gave that away free online. And this was the early 2000s. So it was before most people were self-publishing. It, it was kind of ahead of the curve a little bit before mm -hmm. you could fill your Kindle up with free books from anywhere. Uh, and, and really that that took off for me. And, and, and it kind of it, it was a cyclical thing. It I kept, I was writing, I was making money from writing, just doing it all myself. Mm -hmm. And I just kept thinking, well, the more I write, the more money I'll make. And then I wrote a book which caught the attention, as we said, of Guillermo del Toro and then St. Martin's Press on the back of that. And then St. Martin's Press bought, bought up my back catalogue at the time. So now that I look at it in the benefit of, of hindsight, it's almost as if 
it, it publishing stuff myself and then having it picked up at a later date was almost a replacement for the the submission to editors and agents that we used to do in the past. That's so do, fascinating do because it, well, yeah, but what what strikes me about that? So I I can I come from more or less the same time period that you do. So I first started yeah. doing novels back in the early nineties. So I've been yeah. around long enough to see the whole world completely change. You know, there was no such thing as online writing back when we started. But what strikes me is I go to a lot of conferences and the agents will tell writers, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I really literally, I haven't had to look for an agent in a long time. And, and they'll say, don't self-publish your book because if, it, if your book comes out, if you self-publish, I won't be able to resell it to a publisher. Publishers only want truly fresh stuff. And I've heard that from several agents, but I've also heard from writers such as yourself, no, no, the opposite is true. It's useful to self-publish and then get feedback. And I find this totally confusing because I, yeah. I hear I, I hear completely, con I mean, I, I'm not interested in doing it myself, but I mean, for writers that, that I talk to, I have no idea what the, what, where, where the truth lies or whether, I'm not, I mean, not in terms of falsehood, but just like, like, uh, is it worth the risk for people yeah. to be self-publishing their work? And I, th I think it is. It is a real risk. But when I look back at the time when when I did that, it for me it was it was the path with the least ri least risk attached to it because I mm. could just keep writing and just keep trying to find an agent or a, a publisher or, uh, and and hope that I'd get lucky or. Well, see, the the thing for me is I, I wanted to develop a readership, and that's what I managed to do with Autumn, particularly with mm. giving it away. Uh, I was I, it, it wrapped up a, a heck of a lot of downloads very very quickly, oh, and then yeah. I wrote a series of sequels, and then I, I there was a really absolutely horrendously terrible film adaptation of the first book. <laughs> uh, well, how did that Ginger. feel? What was that like? You you well, you you write vi warshawski and a movie comes out that people don't like so you... <laughs> yeah it, it 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 was good it, it's somebody said to me right at the beginning it's always better to have a film made of it's it's better to have a bad film made of your book than no film at all that and, and that's what i got eventually um so i it, it just happened it was at the same time that that uh, del toro was showing interest in hater and i uh -huh. had kind of the, the two extremes of the spectrum i had a very small independent canadian company asking about the autumn film rights and then Guillermo del Toro and Mark Johnson and all the big guys looking at, at Hater. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I sign with both of these, it's likely that one of them will be made and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, I think what undid the autumn film was that the budget didn't really stretch to, to, to do the material to do with the material, what we needed to do. It's a, it's a yeah. book about it's, it's kind of a different zombie apocalypse because um, everybody dies on on chapter one page one chapter one huh. uh, apart from a few people and we just follow those few people and it's about the progression of the undead i hate using the word zombie it's so cliched now but it's the progression of the undead that they're, they're as much characters as the characters themselves are they sure. change throughout and it became this this monstrous thing it became um six books and i'm, I'm toying with the idea of writing another trilogy because it is so popular but you kind of you lose control and and it's kind of like publishing itself when you you sign that contract and you say right here's my book or here's my property for a film, you're you're giving away control. And yeah. for me, that's another aspect of independent publishing that that I love. I have some things. I have, I'll, I'll write some books and I and I think yeah, I know that that could find an audience and I'll push that towards my agent. Mm. But I also write things which I know that if I gave to him to read, he'd say yeah, about five people would read this. Mm. You know, but but it gives you that opportunity to to get it out there and to find that that audience and i think just going back to your original question the original point it it, it does work if you find that audience and i think we're, we're talking it gets very um corporate and very economical but i think if you can prove yourself with self-publishing and you can show that you've got an audience that people want to buy your books that's when I found that the the larger presses will start circling and think, yeah, I, I'd like a bit of that, please. That's really wonderful. I, I'm I'm really happy that that you were able to to share your experience about that because I haven't actually talked to a lot of people who who've uh, who've gone into to self publishing. I mean, well, and the other the other piece that we haven't even talked about at all though is that you, the writer, uh, have to you have to develop like a quality control technique. You, do. you have to you be do. able to make sure that if you're putting something out there, that it's going to be the quality that you would publish if you were a publisher. And, you know, and 
And I think a lot of people, and, and you got to worry about things that publishers traditionally take care of for you, such as yeah. formatting and, you know, I, I don't know, all that crap, all that just mm -hmm. stuff or you know, creating a cover and making sure the cover isn't awful, you know, and, and, and all those things that it's easy for us to make fun of, but it's because just because somebody's a decent writer doesn't mean they're going to be a decent like art director. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah. all of that is super hard. And I'm sure that most of that stuff did not exist for you when you started self-publishing back in, you know, in the 90s. But yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It didn't. And it has been a, a huge learning process for me. But mm -hmm. one thing, one decision that I did make when I, I first released Autumn myself was that if I am going to do this, then if I produce print copies, they need to be indistinguishable from books that have been produced by the big presses. Yeah. So in terms of quality control, I, I'd got that there from, from the start. And I thought, I'll produce the book. And if I look at it and it doesn't match up, then honestly, I have to go back. I wouldn't be happy trying to sell something that wasn't of the right quality. To fix it's it. got to the, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's got to the stage now where you can do so much. You know, I work with editors. I work with artists. I work with translators. I work with mm. audio book narrators. And it really... I can get to the, to the point where I've got a, a professionally produced book, which will sit alongside my books from St. Martin Press and, and Galantz in the UK and, and whoever else is publishing them. Mm -hmm. And I think if I hadn't been able to do that, then perhaps I, I wouldn't have continued with, with independent publishing. And I call it, I very consciously call it independent publishing because, and I know I've said self-publishing a few times in this conversation, but yeah. I think still self-publishing, it, it, it kind of smacks of desperation. It, Isn't that it, interesting? It makes, yeah, you think that when you hear the word self-publishing, I think it sounds like, well, nobody else will look at this, so I'm going to do it myself, whereas that's not, not always the case. You can have a lot where well, you have a lot more control and you can actually earn. earn. It's not all about money. It's all about the art, I know, but you can earn a lot more money from self-publishing with certain books if, if you market them correctly. Right, and you can market in a way that, that a traditional publisher might not want to. Yeah. You know, it might be a smaller... You can have a bigger percentage of a smaller group that Absolutely. might not interest the publisher. Uh, well, I mean, think about this. I, I've thought about this a lot, where if you if you write a play, let's let's say that you went out this weekend and, and you decided, oh my gosh, I have the coolest variation on uh, on Scrooge. I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm going to write a Christmas carol, you know, for 2020 that's going to blow people's minds. You could write it this this weekend and you can maybe stage it this Christmas and you can put up the money yourself and you can put it on a stage and hire actors and people go and there's nobody who's going to go, Oh, I wouldn't go watch that because it's a quote unquote self-produced play. It's yes. a play. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, there's you're absolutely something. Right. And yet you, you... somehow that's not the case with books. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. You go, you go and see you. I'll be as happy going to see an independent movie as a, 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 a corporate big studio movie. In fact, in many ways, I'm happier seeing an independent movie because, you know, a lot of the, there's that debate raging at the moment between, is it Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese about whether Marvel films have any value at all? Well, oh, I, God, I love yeah. them because they you can just switch your brain off and watch them for a couple of hours and enjoy them. They, they serve different purposes, but I think it's people are a lot more forgiving, as you say, with plays and yes. with films than they are with books. Yeah. And that is, that is very strange. And maybe it's because even if you're a, even if you are an independent producer of plays, or movies you still had to convince other people to yeah. work with you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. which is not necessarily the case with books um you know it's also a problem of the wheat and the shaft there's just so much stuff out there so it's, there, it's uh, there is and, and i think that, that that's the biggest difference from when i started publishing independently to now back yeah. then it was it was quite easy to get noticed because it wasn't a huge wasn't a particularly crowded playing field whereas today it's, it's every man and his dog and then his cat and his goldfish are also producing books it seems yeah yeah uh so tell me a little bit about your process are you working on a new uh i i know you said you have you have more uh apocalyptic ideas but uh are you working on a on a new book right now i am yeah and and i've kind of gone non-apocalyptic for once um but it's it, it's it's always well i say it's not it's not apocalyptic and it's not it's about a couple and it's the mm. end of their their relationship very brutal end of their relationship which kind of makes it apocalyptic for them and it's it's just going to be a very different different thing for me. It's called "Was She Ever There," which mm. is a line from a Bowie song from many years ago. Mm. Uh, and and the basic setup: husband and wife head over heels in love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, 
the first chapter ends with a car crash and the wife dies. Mm -hmm. And then the husband is in grieving and the wife comes back in a kind of, I don't do normally ghosts, the occult gods, et cetera, et cetera, but she comes back and he's haunting him or is she? Haunting That's a great him? idea. I, yeah, love, it, I love that. Don't pinch that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. A, <laughs> we, now no, I'm going to no, be racing across. We do if you go out. <laughs> I know. Writers, I'm, I'm only. I'm only. Holy mackerel! Um, no, no, no. But, so, um, so yeah. So yeah. But the, the thing about this is that you you've got your idea of the relationship at the beginning of the book, but then the longer that the 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 wife has this kind of different relationship with the husband, you see that it's maybe not what you thought at the start. Mm. So it's 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 quite cool. Well, I I, I think it's quite cool. We we'll know yeah. how cool my agent thinks it is in a couple of months' time, where it'll either come out through St. Martin Press or similar, or infected books. My little label. So we'll see. Do you think? Uh, do you think it's important for you to just keep? Because it sounds to me like you just keep working. You finish one project yeah. and start another. Um, so is this just? Do you, do you try to set aside time every day? Like, uh, well, you know, I'm going to get my 500 or a thousand words. Like, how, like, what do you expect of yourself? Well, I I'm very fortunate in that I, I can write pretty quickly. I think, you, well, I, I accept that most of what you, you write first or second draft is going to be jettisoned anyway. So I can just bang the pages out and, and just get those words on the screen, mm. um, which which is good. I do I do always have to be writing. But that said, I, when everything took off with, with Hater and Guillermo del Toro, um, I went full-time writing. I did it for mm -hmm. about six years. But then I, I realised, strangely, that the more time that I'd had, I had to write – the more procrastinating I did mm. and the the lower the quality of the work, I thought. I think a lot of that was because writing is such a, a solitary profession. You do it on your own. And and my wife said to me what, at one point, um, how can you write stories about people anymore when you don't know anybody? And I'd become <laughs> I'd kind of become a hermit. Yeah. So I went I went back out to work. Um and that's actually about five years ago now. And and bizarrely I found that Although I'm really struggling for time, my output hasn't dropped hugely. Right. Um, I, I would still love to have more time to write, but yeah, I, I'm I'm getting the books out there, and and also the inspiration is still there because I'm surrounded by people all day, every day. There are always ideas there. I've got books and books of ideas that I promised myself that's going to be the next book, and that's going to be the next book. I think I've probably got my next decades writing already planned out. And, and I'll probably I'll probably write none of that and just write something completely different. Yeah, you never know because you yeah. could. I, I I ended up writing, I ended up writing a book that I haven't sold yet, but I, I haven't even tried. But it was based on Gidget, and it was because I was yeah. like on a vacation and somebody was playing Gidget the surf movie, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh no, this there's something here, and you know, and suddenly you're like, I'm jettisoning everything I thought I was working on, and I'm working I on. I, I, I completely get that. Um, a couple of, a couple, <laughs> couple of months ago, um, my wife and I went on a cruise to Norway. We'd always said we were going to go on a cruise, so we just thought we'd try it. Yeah. And and we're, we're just going along on the boat, and then I just realized, oh, I've got a book coming. And <laughs> it's just just been on, on one of these huge, all-inclusive cruises. There's like 2,000 uh, passengers. There's 1,000 staff. This yeah. enormous machine that's cutting through the ocean. And then this is an apocalyptic one, I'm afraid, but I'm just thinking, well, what happens if the end of the world kicks off and these people are still going along through the ocean on on, on this little island yeah. with with limited supplies? And, and it kind of becomes a Lord of the Flies thing, a bit of a fight for survival. Where Again, where do your loyalties lie? Who, is it with the crew? Is it with the cooks? What you need to do that one as soon as possible because uh that's uh that's you could do that really well but there's going to be a race in that one because i think some uh, i'm not talking about myself i'm not but <laughs> but but uh, i'm saying that is such a perfectly like cotton gin sort of easy idea it's a hard idea to think of it's an easy yeah. idea to grasp and those yeah. are the best so <laughs> So you got to get on that one. Right. So that, that one goes to the top of the list then. Thank you. Uh, gosh, because you could sit down at lunch with somebody and just explain that and they instantly get it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, uh, David Moody, the new book is called Chokehold. It is uh, it is the last book in the haters versus the unchanged in the up in the post apocalyptic England. That is your world. It has been so fun to talk about your process and about writing and independent publishing and traditional publishing. It, it was very broad, and I'm very thankful that you would spend time with us. I, I had an absolute blast. Thank you. Really appreciate appreciated it. Yes, sir. Let's talk soon. Bye. Yeah, definitely.